board on this computer. All right, so now that we are officially recording, um, a reminder that, hi, I'm Pastor Josh from St. Michael Lutheran and Christ Community Lutheran, and we're doing a Bible study on Jacqueline Bussey's book, uh, Outlaw Christian, and right now we're talking about faith in our lives, and particularly whether it is a crutch in a time of need or something that is something that guides our life. So what other thoughts do y'all have on that? There's one example in particular I want to bring up, but I want to hear what y'all say first. Well, I think faith is a crutch or not a crutch is a, is indicative of, of where you are as a Christian at that time. Right. I had many, many years that I was not going to church on Sunday and my faith was weak and I would use it as a crutch as I needed it. Whereas now I don't really use it as a crutch. I don't feel I do. Maybe maybe other people think I do, but I just know it's there all the time that I have faith that he's going to watch over me. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm at that point too, Barbara, that I, I just put every day in the Lord's hands because I can't I can't do this life on my own. You know, I every mm -hmm. time I try to do something. It just doesn't work out or, you know, I know it's the wrong thing to do. So I just put everything in the Lord's hands and see where it goes. Um, and try so to listen. Go ahead, Kathy. Go ahead. And li listen, try to listen to what he's telling us instead of blocking. I know I'm guilty of that blocking things that I know that he's trying to tell me. And um, and like I say, go over, like Jackie was saying, you you get up in the morning and I say, well, thank the Lord for giving me another day. And that, and I hope I live it like he wants me to. And, and to be a, a godly person to, and talk, you know, don't run my mouth when I'm not supposed to or whatever. I know we are, we all guilty of that, I think. So, mm -hmm. you know, but we just have to be on the, on our P's and Q's, I reckon you'd say. Yep. <laughs> and, uh, so let me, let me throw this out there, okay? Um, and, and I'm glad Barbara brought up DeMar Hamlin in the prayer circle earlier. Um, for those of you who weren't on there um, and who haven't heard, uh, DeMar Hamlin is a, a linebacker or a safety for the Buffalo Bills. And uh, live on television on Monday Night Football, when he was trying to make a tackle on T. Higgins, who was a receiver out of Clemson, um, he got, it, it looked like a regular tackle, but he stood up after the tackle and then fell straight down. And the next thing we knew there was an ambulance on the field and they were doing CPR and they had to use an AED and apparently his heart stopped. And, you know, there's, there's tons of speculation as to why, right. You know, cause everybody's a, a, a social media doctor and, they had their little Google certificates and whatnot. Um, but, you know, he was transported to University of Cincinnati Medical Center, and um, he's still there in intensive care. They haven't said really what the actual cause was, just that his heart stopped and that he had to be resuscitated and that he's um, he's got a machine breathing for him at least half of the time right now. They're hoping that he will heal up and they're trying to take it slow, right? Um, and what we saw immediately after this happened, because so many people saw it live and it shocked so many people because y'all, I've, I've been involved in football all my life. One of the earliest memories I have is watching football with my dad, right? You know, I've never seen anything like that happen on a football field. I've seen people have to get taken to the hospital in an ambulance, but that's always been because, you know, like they they came they they landed wrong in a tackle and they broke something or or something like that and you know they were doing it as a precaution. Um, never something like somebody basically dying on the field. And you saw you know players praying out on the field, right? And you saw people in the stands praying. Um, and then it kind of spread to where there was a prayer vigil held outside the hospital that's been going on now for several days. 
and uh, everybody on social media was posting pray for Demar, right? And uh, people found his his charity online, his GoFundMe for his um, toy foundation or for his foundation, which was doing a toy drive a couple years ago. And he was only asking for twenty five hundred dollars, and within six hours, it was over five million dollars donated. Right? It's just all kinds of of things. Um, and so we saw everybody's faith come out in that moment, right? But we see that a lot when something tragic happens, okay? Just like after 9-11, when that happened, churches were suddenly full again, right? And that lasted for about a year because it shocked everybody so badly and they needed something outside of themselves. So they went back to church. Okay. We see it when there's a, a natural, <laughs> you know, people remember churches again because the churches step up and they do things. And so for us who are going to church on a regular basis, it is a permanent fixture, right? We try to make faith a permanent fixture of our lives. But for a lot of the rest of the world, it seems to become a crutch that they lean on in a time of need and then forget about very shortly thereafter. Okay. And one of the things that I think we should kind of consider as we're going through this study is how do we as the church speak to issues in faith that drive, that have, that not that drive people away, but that people struggle with so that we can help people who aren't coming to church on a regular basis still make faith a permanent fixture of their life. You know, ideally, we would have people come to church all the time, but that's just not going to happen. Okay? So how do we help our sisters and brothers who aren't coming still be faithful? And how do we have, well, how do we set an example that shows them that faith is something worth invested in something worth taking the time with okay um so when you think about your faith okay whether it's you know as a permanent fixture how it informs your life does your faith ever feel restrictive to you is there anything that your faith keeps you from doing that you would like to do Yes. Is that a trick question? <laughs> no, no. I mean, y'all know me. I can give me. you an easy example. Go ahead. I've got these squirrels stealing my nuts. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I believe that's God's creature, and I'm not supposed to kill them, but I want to kill them. And I have. So that's, a, that's an example. I'm not right now. Right now, I'm in my conscience of Barbara. All right. So setting aside the possible image of Barbara on her back porch with a 20-gauge trying to take out squirrels, um, y'all know how I am, okay? I am, by nature, a quick-witted, sarcastic person, right? I I tone it down and try to, to keep it under control as much as possible within the church and everything, and... And that's not just with y'all, that is in my everyday life. I try to keep it, you know, because sarcasm can sometimes hurt people's feelings if they don't understand it. And you have to be careful, right? Um, but there are definitely days when people do things and I would like to help them by informing them how wrongly they've done something. Um, and I hold myself back because I know that from an eighth commandment point of view, looking at them with the best possible light, that there are other reasons why they may have done whatever they've done to annoy me and that I should try to give them the benefit of the doubt, even though I would really like to sit them down and, you know, explain to them the ways I think they're wrong. Well, there's a, a song from the 70s, and it's called Drop Kicking Jesus to the Bones of Life. Sometimes I'm going to just 
do that to some people. Yeah. I was, I'm glad you brought that song up and not like cruel to be kind. Cause that was going to go in a different <laughs> direction. I don't think we need to go that way. Um, Josh, I think you're very nice, but, and, and I think people, you know, they come under conviction from God, you know, God convicts, you know, when you're doing something wrong, he tells you. Yeah. Well, I mean, when we look at sin, right. And then sin is the most obvious way we, we, you know, are restricted in our faith because obviously if we're faithful, we try not to do things that are sinful, right? Sin separates us from God. But a lot of things that are sinful are things that we enjoy, right? You know, it feels good to be able to tell somebody off no matter what, okay? It, it's not nice, but it feels good. You know, it feels good to be able to go out and take what you want, whether it belongs to somebody or not. It's not right, but it feels good, okay? to our in ourselves, our, our base humanity that tends to be rather greedy, we like to do things that are sinful, okay? And our faith restricts us from that, right? So let me, let me kind of take at it or go at it from a different tack. So if our faith restricts us a little bit, okay? It wouldn't be wrong to say that it has rules. We kind of already said that, right? There's commandments, there's law, rules, that kind of thing, right? And those aren't bad things necessarily, right? You know, the commandments, God's law, the, that's God's good word. It's stuff that's meant for our, you know, mutual well-being, okay? Um, but when you live by those rules and you live differently than the rest of the world, people notice, right? So have you ever been told by somebody that you believe the wrong thing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Anybody want to yeah. share an example? Oh, when I was 13 and I found out I had the five brain tumors and six months to live, some of my friends were like, why would God do that to you? And I said, why wouldn't God do that to me? You know, maybe I'm just a an example of his love and to share it and, you know. Yeah. Well, and I, I love that, that positive outlook that you have there. But then, you know, I immediately jumped to wanting to tell those people that they're wrong in what they believe. Because how can you believe in a God that would do that to somebody? You know, I don't think God inflicts hardship, you know, and pain and stuff like that on us. I think God is right there next to us when those things happen. And God wishes that they didn't happen just as much as we do. You know, but, so I, you know, but we live in a sinful world. So yep. we're always going to have pain as we long are. as we're here. And certainly it's, no fault to Stephen, because we like Stephen. Yeah. <laughs> I, I hope. <laughs> we like Stephen. <laughs> um, what gets me, you're talking about, um, the, the, you know, the, what gets me is when you, they show these babies on television. This I need a baby babies, you know, and they may have, especially from that St. Jude, they'll show you those babies that have the, the cancer and all this other kind of stuff. And it is, I, I just, when I see that, it just breaks my heart. And I said, you know, like, why would he, you know, you, you're not supposed to question God, but I said, why would he let a, a baby, you know, just been born, you know, come in the world for a while and then take it, take it away, you know, I mean, I, I know I shouldn't feel that way, but I don't know well, whether no, anybody else. I, I 100% understand because, you know, this past weekend, my niece, Cheyenne, my oldest niece, spent the weekend at MUSC Children's Hospital in Charleston. Um, she has a, a really rare condition called tuberous sclerosis, um, mm. where she has these tumors all over her body, right? Mm. Um, this is a genetic condition. The, the guy who my sister had 
Cheyenne with and who is not a part of their life knew he had that genetic condition and that he would pass it down and mm. did not take any precautions the way they should have anyway. Um, he has in fact done this several times and, mm. and basically abandoned those kids. Um, mm. And uh, you know, can we shoot him? No, unfortunately not. That's, that's one of those restrictive mm. things in faith because it would be a greater wrong to do that to him. Ultimately, we have to believe that God has some purpose for his life. Mm. Well, this and that's is a hard a, one. The type situation that I have trouble forgiving, and I know I'm supposed to forgive, but I, I just can't hardly forgive people like that. I, I, I just, understand. It's so difficult. It is, it is very hard to do something. Oh, he, also, he, also was a, <laughs> he also was a domestic abuser. Um, it gets worse. Yeah, I got my sister out of that, and my mm. niece when she was like four months old. So mm. Rosie and I did. Um, yes, is, is your niece on our, our prayer list? If she's not, she should be. Yeah, she should be, but uh, I probably have not put her on there because I had not shared that story before. Um, you want you want to put her on there now, right sure. now. Her name is Cheyenne, so it's C H E Y E N N E. Her last name is Gibson, G I B S O N. I'll, I'll put her right over on the on the long term list. I won't put her on the short list. Well, I, I'm going to send you an updated list, Kathy. I'm speaking for you. I'm sorry. That's all right. So, um, so yeah, I, I have a lot of problem with people who, who say that God would inflict that kind of thing on someone. Um, I do know that, that because of Cheyenne and because of knowing her, um, she has affected all of our lives. Um, she's one of the reasons that Rosie did a specialization when she was doing her credentials coming out of uh, early childhood education and has a, a state credential in special education. Um, mm. She is somebody who has made me take a much closer look at the, the work that MUSC Children's Health is doing um, and support them. Um, you know, she's had a, an impact on, on Sarah, my sister, um, and their family. And you know, also on the way I look at healing, because, you know, we often pray for a miracle to happen, right? And the reality is a miracle in our eyes might look like her suddenly turning up tomorrow as perfect and nothing wrong with her at all, right? Whereas a healing miracle in God's eyes might look like her in condition improving somewhat and her being able to communicate better to us what the world looks like through her eyes and being able to see something different through her. You know, that would be a healing. And so it's, mm -hmm. it's changed my way of, of looking at that kind of thing. Um, and so I, you know, I, I, I definitely would struggle with somebody saying that God inflicted that because I don't think that's how God is, but I think that God uses every situation, whatever it is, to to lead us forward right you know they want to um blame god you know that's the first thing and they say well, god why'd you let this happen to me or whatever and but you got to have your faith to to carry on too yeah well it, it's convenient to blame god because god doesn't often argue back right you know there's not one person who's ever gotten mad at god and god suddenly appeared before them and said oh yeah um mm -hmm. And that's a good thing because that would be a problem for all of us. Well, there's a, there's a, a saying and I have used it and I've sort of come a, around to know better is that God lets it happen. Yeah. Or that a God lot doesn't people. give you anything more than what you can handle. Um, I, I have a problem with that particular mm -hmm. saying too. And that's said a lot. Yeah. Yeah. But if, if we think about it 
Jesus went through all the pain for us. He went through much worse. Yep. And so, I mean, I think sometimes people lose their faith because they blame God for all the bad things that have happened in their life. They shouldn't be blaming God. If, if they really understood how he, how Jesus went to the cross and suffered much worse. Well, kind of in that same vein, has anybody ever attacked what you believed? No. Yeah, in my younger days. <laughs> in a, in a, you know, what do you mean? Like, well, like, for example, so I, when we moved to Andrews, Okay, when I was starting ninth grade, you know, we moved from Columbia, which is, you know, an urban area and has Lutherans and Catholics and Episcopalians and a lot of the more traditional, you know, denominations and such. We moved down there and we suddenly were immersed in a sea of, of Baptist of every different type and Pentecostal holiness and churches that had paragraphs for names and and, um, you know, they were very, very different and did not hesitate to tell us that if we believed some of the things that Lutherans believe, we were going to hell. That, that you know, if we, I had one pastor tell me once that if I dared to write down a prayer, that I was going to hell because of something that that's, he had noticed in scripture, right? Um they would tell you that going to seminary was was dumb because the Holy Spirit would equip you with everything you needed to be able to preach and teach people um, and stuff like that. So, you know, I it was it was interesting trying to to continue being a Lutheran. And and, you know, I actually I'm the only one in my family who really did, except my sister, Sarah. Most of my family drifted off and and got rebaptized as Baptist and you know other stuff. So if it works for them, it works for them. I'm not degrading those faiths. They are what they are, and everybody should worship how they desire to worship. But we should also not tear each other down either. So, have any of you ever kind of had your beliefs attacked? in that way so i'm not doing all the talking yeah hey it's kathy this time hey kathy <laughs> um i was gonna say that um this has happened when he was younger um and it, you know what's happening again by his own wife but kenneth um it get, gets told frequently that he's not baptized that yeah. his baptism yeah. is not true so he's going through that right now because she's concerned about his salvation <laughs> Uh, they all attend church together, but but he's going through that. And he told her that he would he would take it under serious advisement, and he would do his own studies, and and but that he felt that he was baptized and that it was unnecessary. So it and it, but I feel like I'm being attacked too when that happens, and I'm not mad at her because I believe her concern is genuine. Yeah, it comes from a good you know, place. It comes from a good place. Right. But um, he also heard that a lot as a younger person through when he would attend my sister's Pentecostal Holiness Church, they would tell him he wasn't baptized. So um, if he wants to talk about that and, and find some resources to look at to kind of make his own decision there, um, give him my number and I'm happy to talk to him because I've, I've got a, a list of things that he can look at and just kind of read through and decide for himself what he wants to believe there. That's wonderful. And they actually plan to be at church this coming Sunday. So be yeah. prepared. There might be four extra children. <laughs> I, I'm happy to see any extra children or adults who act like children. So. <laughs> um, well, some, can, go ahead, Bonnie. I can say this. Some, sometimes I feel badly that, I don't put myself out there enough to be attacked for my beliefs. I, it, it's like, even when I put out 
even when I was trying to buy a Christmas banner to hang on my flagpole, it was, I, I had to find one that expressed my beliefs, but didn't put them out there dangerously, right. so to speak. I, it, I, it's hard for me to express what I'm saying here, but so I, I have a banner out there that says joy to the world. It yeah. means what it means to me, as in the, you know, Christ is born and joy to the world. But at the same time, it is non-committal. It's very um, non-denominational, and I, I, I'm not sure exactly what I'm trying to say. But oh. I'm I'm wimpy in my faith. I guess is what I'm trying to say. I don't I don't know that I would call it wimpy. It's it, what it is is faith is something that's extremely personal to all of us, right? Um, it is something that's such an intimate part of us that we shield because we're afraid that if we put it out there overly much and somebody comes at us, that it'll shake us in some way. And so it's something that we protect. Um, you don't want to have to defend yourself about what you believe. Okay. Um, nobody wants to have to deal with that. And so I, I, I get where you're where you're coming from there. And I don't think you're being wimpy. I think you're you're being, you know, kind of where we all are in a lot of ways. Um, you know, I when I was first starting off in seminary, you know, I was very hesitant to put things out there. Um, not the least of which because like especially social media, right? Because not the least of which because I had friends from high school and stuff who were I knew were going to be absolutely floored to discover that I had suddenly decided to become a pastor because that was not the Josh they knew. Okay. And and this was that's who I was, but it wasn't necessarily the person I always acted to everybody. And so, you know, it was hard to to be able to start putting that stuff out there and and being who I really was. Um, probably one of the best things that ever happened. And if you ever tell him, I will, I will disown you. But Stephen Mims up at Pisgah in Lexington decided that he was going to start making me do the prayers every Sunday, but I wasn't allowed to write prayers down. I had to go up there and do the prayers of intercession off the cuff and, and pray for the needs of the congregation as I heard them and and stuff like that. And because I got comfortable being able to do that and being able to express the needs that I heard and stuff like that, I suddenly was able to have a lot more confidence in, you know, putting my safe, myself out there as a faithful person, as somebody who was trying to become a pastor, as somebody who was trying to live a better life. Um, like I said, if you ever tell him, I will disown you and I will deny that I ever said any of this and I'll delete this video. But, you know, because his head is already too big. He doesn't need any blowing up. But you know, that's probably one of the things that that definitely did it for him. <laughs> so. um, just, just go ahead. One more thing. I'm just going to follow up on that. It's and sort of like what you're saying too, in a way, I don't have a problem expressing my faith and um, being uh, even confident in my faith and witness in a supportive environment. Yeah. Last Sunday, I, I basically did all of the readings and all of the liturgy that was in that bulletin and leading the, not exactly leading the hymns, but, you know, being up there for it. And I had no problem with that. I felt actually very confident and supported and held, upheld in doing that. 
but that was with a group of people who I already knew believed the same things that I did and that were in my corner, so to speak. And I felt really good about that. Yep. But it, it, it is such a different thing in my neighborhood and in my outside world. Well, even within Christianity, right? One of the things that causes me the most anxiety every year that we do is the, the community Lenten services that we participate in with the Methodist Church. Because after you get done preaching and you come down and talk to everybody, there's always a chance that you said one little thing that hit somebody wrong and you're about to get an earful from somebody who thinks you're a heretic. You know, and and so I every year I I go through that sermon with a fine tooth comb to make sure that everything I said is defensible within the scope of Lutheranism. So at least I know from our faith tradition, I have not committed anything that's heretical. Um, as far as what the Methodists think, I can't I can't help that. So. It's, it's a really hard thing because, you know, I've been in different jobs and, you know, sometimes I've witnessed to people that were Christians and, you know, we were in agreement and then you come along with some other people that they're just worldly, you know, they're in the world, you know, and Jesus tells us we're not supposed to be, be we, a Christian will be different from the world yep. and that we should, we should be showing that. It's a lot easier to blend in, though, isn't it? Right. <laughs> you know, we don't draw attention to ourselves, then we don't have to worry about anybody, body, ooh, words, Joshua, about anybody putting an eye on us, right? Oh, it's but, just like when I was younger. I'm not saying how much younger, but I went to a Baptist church Sunday school, and the teacher said, who knows what John 3.16 is? And I, I told him, he goes, you're wrong. I'm like, what? It's not everlasting, it's eternal. And I'm like, uh, uh. Yeah. Yeah, we had the, the translations of the Bible debate in confirmation earlier this afternoon. Um, when I had to explain to them that all translations of the Bible are translations of the original Hebrew and Greek and pieces at that. So, um, okay. So what I want to do tonight in our last few minutes here is kind of introduce what, what Jacqueline Bussey is going to talk about in her book, because her book deals with faith, as you might expect. Okay. Um, and so what she talks about is how to have faith while breaking the rules. So Jacqueline Bussey is a, a rostered leader in the ELCA. Um, she is also a professor at Concordia uh, College up in, um, I believe it's Minnesota. Um, she has uh, a degree in theology and ethics from the University of Virginia, and she went to Yale and She's a very smart person, very, very smart person. Um, and what she's done with her book is she has taken the book and divided it up into six chapters. And each chapter addresses a rule that we often find in Christianity and faith that people say we should never break. Okay. And so these are the six rules that she says most people tell us we should never break if we really are faithful. The first one is never get angry at God, okay? And I'm sure we have all heard somebody tell us that at some point in our lives. Although I hope you have heard me say repeatedly that it's okay to get angry at God, that the Bible is full of people who get angry at God. Um, and that's what the whole point of the lament is. And that's half of the book of Psalms. Um, but I digress from her rules. So the first one is never get angry at God. And that's what we'll be talking about next week. And I will send you a photocopy of that chapter. Um, for those of you who don't have a book, I will try to get you a book if you're close by. Um, but for those of you who aren't, I will, I will get you the photocopy of the chapters. 
Um, the second rule is never doubt. Um, and I, we hear that all the time, right? We're never supposed to doubt God. Never doubt, never doubt. Any kind of doubt is the devil creeping in. Okay. Well, the reality is we can't be questioning humans with intellect that God gave us. If doubt doesn't sometimes come up, it's okay to have doubt. The disciples had plenty of doubt. They all but abandoned Jesus at one point. Okay. But they managed to make out okay. The third one is never question. You know, a lot of us are taught from an early age that we should never question God, never demand to know why things are the way they are, never question what we're taught as far as faith goes, that we're just supposed to accept everything that we hear. So when we say the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed, it doesn't matter what all those things mean. It just matters that you say, yes, you believe that because that's what we believe. And that's what you believe if you're here. Okay. Whereas if we're thinking people, we should have the ability to question these things, to push back on things and to ask why we believe the things that we believe. Well, when I was a Sunday school teacher, the kid said, it's okay. I'm like, it's okay to ask God why, but it's never okay to ask God why. And they're like, what does that mean? I'm like, it's how you put the emphasis on the word why. Yeah, I mean, I, you might be splitting hair a little bit there, but yeah. Um. The fourth rule is never tell your real story, which is exactly what we were just talking about a minute ago. So basically, you know, when you're in church, you are your faithful self. You get to be your real self. When you go back out into the world, you put your mask back on and you do your thing so that nobody bugs you, right? You know, you might let it out a little bit when you do something kind for somebody, but for the most part, you keep it to yourself. Faith is so personal. Number five is always speak in cliches about suffering. Okay, so God never gives you more than you can handle. Or, um, you know, uh, what's the, the, the worst one? The one that gets me the most is when somebody has passed away. And you hear somebody say, God must have needed another angel. Mm -hmm. I am a pastor and I have come close to ripping somebody's face off at a funeral over that. Okay. Because that is not helpful. And that is, you're just filling the air with, with nonsense. Please don't ever say that. Okay. God is not snatching people from the earth's surface to become angels. That is not how God works. And if, and that, that, no, just no. Okay. Luckily, there's a chapter about that. <laughs> um, and then the last chapter is always believe hope comes easy if you truly love God. Because we get told that a lot. That if we just believe hard enough, everything will work out. We'll have hope, we'll have riches, we'll have all the gifts of the spirit, we'll have all the gifts of the world, and everything will be fine. And I don't think there's a person on this Zoom meeting who hasn't believed for something with all their heart and then did not get what they thought they wanted. Because God is not a vending machine. You can't put in 50 cent and choose what drink you want or what miracle you want. God don't work like that. Okay. So these are the six rules that the Jacqueline Bussey says that are very common within faith. And that these are the rules that if we can learn how to break them in a, in a healthy way, then we can have a faith that is much, much stronger. Okay, because we stop limiting ourselves 
in the ways that we believe and we stop limiting ourselves in the way we interact with others, okay, from a faith point of view. Um, like I said, she came and spoke to us when I was at the seminary. Uh, she came in for a, we have something at the seminary called the Academy of Faith and Leadership, and Dr. Barfield was in charge of it back then. And she brought Dr. Bussey in to talk to us, and she's a very interesting person. Um, she she really is very passionate about this subject, about how to get out of these rules and and really build your faith up. And she has another book that came out after this called Love Without Limits that is also very good. Um, so that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, and hopefully that'll lead us pretty nicely because it's a six week study, right? Six week, six chapters. Um, that'll lead us very nicely into Ash Wednesday and Lent. Um, and of course, during Lent, we do our, our weekly services and stuff, but this is also a good way to help us prep for Lent, right? Because Lent is a reflective period and a time to kind of look at our faith. And we're going to do a, some stuff during Lent to kind of work on that. But this will set us up for success in that because it's going to help us take a deep look at what we believe and, and the rules that we've kind of put around ourselves as guardrails and break free of that so that our faith is a little bit more lively, I guess would be the right word. Okay. Um, so if you, um, if you want to get the book yourself, it is called um, Outlaw Christian. It is available on Amazon. Um, if you want me to get the book for you um, through the church, then just let me know. Either way is fine. It's up to you. Um, if you have a, like a tablet that you want to get it on, like through Kindle books, it's available through Kindle books. Um, I think it's also available as an audio book and you can have Dr. Bussey read it to you. Um, which is interesting. Um, but either way, just let me know. That way you have it. And if you can't get it at all, um, let me know. And I'll, I'm going to make a photocopy of the first chapter. That way everybody has the first chapter for next week because I know it takes time to get stuff sometimes. Um, and if you need copies after that, just say something, shoot me an email, and I'll make you copies. Um, as long as I'm not copying the whole book all at one time, that is not a violation of copyright law. So, um, thoughts, comments, questions, concerns. I want you to get me a book. You want me to send you something so you won't forget? Nope. I got it written down right now. I get would like one as well. Okay. Me too. Barbara, Snooky, Kathy. Kathy. Well, Judy. Judy. <laughs> well, hello, Judy. Hello, Snooky. <laughs> I'll talk to you tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else want me to get them theirs? Yeah, Pastor, go ahead and get mine, please. All right, Jacqueline. And get mine. And Gail. Here's Gail. what I found. Oh, Lord, something's talking to us. <laughs> I'd be more than happy to pay for mine, but uh, order one for me, too, if you would. That's and Bonnie. I certainly will. Well, I, I assume we were paying for them. Oh, absolutely. That, you, can, mm -hmm. you can make a donation to the church if you would like, but you don't have to because we do have money in the bank for this kind of thing. So. Okay. Okay. Where is Sandy tonight? Is she all right? Sandy had a whole bunch of paperwork that her and her daughter had to look at with some stuff they're doing. So okay. she she said they sent her a book to look at. So oh. and Mary okay. in, in, Mary's oh, in good. town, so that yeah. has something to do with it. Yeah, she's here. I'm just, I just want to make sure she's all right. <laughs> yep, she's good to go. Yeah. Okay. All right. So any other comments questions yes how are you and your back um 
on and off. So I'm, I was, I've been better this afternoon, but this morning, like I didn't get to the church until about 12 o'clock this afternoon because I, I got up on time, ready to go. And my back wasn't ready to go. So I had to wait here until it eased off. Cause I do not like taking that medicine and especially do not like taking that medicine and coming to work. Um, so. Well, I've kept you on the list. I guess you know that. Yeah. I appreciate it. <laughs> so, and Jimmy, I did see your, your uh, message at the beginning. So um, that is definitely something I'm looking at. Love to have you. All right. Any other comments, questions, concerns, smart remarks? <laughs> All right. Lexi, come here. <laughs> She's been waiting in the corner, lurking like a creeper. All right. Tell everybody bye. Good night, Lexi. Good night, Good night. Lexi. Bye bye. Good night, Lexi. Good night, Lexi. Good night, Lexi. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. All right. If y'all need anything, just shoot me an email or send me a text. Um, other than that, go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.